so thank you for, for having me here today. Uh, my name is Peter Knights, uh, and I'm a naturopathic doctor yeah. uh, in private practice down in uh, Fountain, uh, Maine, in a place called Healthy Living Healthcare. Um, are any of you familiar with naturopathic medicine, or do it, is that a form where it's not as, it's becoming more and more widespread, but it's, uh, there's up, I think there's now 25 naturopaths now practicing in the state of Maine, so when I first moved here eight years ago, I think we were 16. So we're gradually, gradually expanding. Um, but in naturopathic medicine, uh, the approach tends to be to work with the body's own ability to heal. And so really looking at what is preventing the body from being uh, in an optimal place and uh, what might it need uh, in order to, to, to be healthy. And so we look at using a lot of different things to achieve those goals. Um, I tend to focus a lot on nutrition in my practice, and so I look at a lot of how food uh, affects health and how food affects how we feel. Um, and using that for a broad range of conditions, ranging from, you know, I work with people who are trying to lower their cholesterol, or people who have chronic pains, aches and pains, or people who are having um, mental and emotional issues, um, or people who have a lot of gastrointestinal issues. So a broad range of conditions where we can look at how changing the diet or using certain foods or using uh, certain nutritional factors can really help to improve, improve health. Um, I also teach a monthly cooking class um, uh, because uh, when I first started practicing and was talking with patients about food, it's one of those things where it's a lot different to talk about food than to experience food. And so um, I, I started teaching a, a cooking class in which we talk about the the health benefits, the nutritional benefits, the uh, agricultural ramifications of the food, um, the environmental issues, and then we cook four to five different things uh, during the class as well. So it's more of an experiential uh, um, way of looking at food. And so it's actually flyers about that, that cooking class um, by the York as well. The next one's coming up next week where we're going to talk about celery and uh, mushrooms. Uh, which is a story behind why those two are together, but now we'll go into that at the moment. Um, so today's talk is entitled, There's a Pharmacy in Your Spice Rack. Uh, and so as I said, I often talk in my practice about the effects of food on health. Uh, but oftentimes we overlook the powerful effects that the things that are kind of, you know, spice up or the condiments that are on our food and how they might actually affect our health. And, and it's actually quite dramatic. Um, some of the effects that some of them have, um, and so we're going to be going through that today. Um, before I get into to that, though, um, do any of you like to cook, or any, any cooks, avid cooks, and, uh, and how about any any favorite herbs or spices that you like to cook with when you do cook? Garlic. 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 <laughs> we'll be definitely talk about garlic. It's, can't have a talk about the health benefits of spice, herbs and spices without talking about garlic. Oregano. 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 Cumin. Cumin. Definitely human. Human. Mm -hmm. Anybody else got a favorite? I can't think of it. It's it's reddish. It's like curry, but it's like it's that sort of sea. It's Indian type. Right? Card cardamom. Cardamom has more of like a. Uh, no, it's not that. Then you're talking about turmeric. 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 Yeah. Yeah, so it's got a bright yellow color. We will yeah. talk about oh, turmeric yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, so. So. Um, the, the thing about spices is that you can incorporate them into your food on a regular basis and without really thinking too much about it, get some of those health benefits. And so that's what I'm going to encourage you from this talk is to take some of the information that I'm giving you today and think about ways that you might be able to, uh, to, to get some of these spices in your, or herbs and spices in your diet on a more regular basis. Uh, historically, uh, Herbs and spices have been looked at in, in some cultures more for their medicinal uh, properties. We think about in uh, both Chinese medicine and um, the Ayurvedic tradition that comes out of, of India, that there was not as much of a separation between food and medicine, and, and the two were kind of brought together, that what you ate was, in many cases, designed to help with, with your health and, and keeping you well. Um, herbs and spices were oftentimes also used to try to preserve foods as well, uh, because they, we now know that many of them inhibit the growth of certain microorganisms 
of an active or antioxidant, so they delay the breakdown of some of the components in the food. Um, and so because they had those effects on, on that preservation side of things, they became and they tasted good, they became incorporated into, into the diet as well. Um, in our medicine cabinet, uh, it's actually many of the uh, many um, prescription and, and over-the-counter medications actually got their starts from isolated uh, compounds from plant products as well. Uh, it's actually estimated that about 25% of pharmaceutical medications um, actually have some plant origin to them. So uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies are always looking for new things that they can uh, market. Many of those do actually come from, from botanicals. Um, frequently, um, when in my practice and with herbal medications, we'll think about using them in tinctures or capsule forms, you know, where you actually take them like a, a medicine. And there are times and places where that is certainly necessary, but um, again, I do find that if you can bring these things in small amounts on a regular and sustained basis, you can get those benefits without having to take an, another pill. So try, and you also get to enjoy them as well. Uh, if, you know, patients who will take, say, come in and say that they're taking capsules of cinnamon, I'm like, well, do you like the taste of cinnamon? And they say, yes, so well, why not eat it as opposed to taking it in a capsule and ignoring the, the flavor of it. Um, so the first er First herb that we're going to look at is what's the popular one uh, that many people uh, mentioned, which is garlic. Um, and garlic is a uh, member of the, the lily family. There's a picture of the, the garlic plant um, coming up in the spring uh, there. And garlic is the, the what we consume typically is the bulb um, that grows underground. Uh, it's actually been uh, cultivated for over 5,000 years. It's one of the older cultivated plants. Um, and has been used in uh, Central Asia, uh, both in the diets and um, medicinally, again, for, for over 5,000 years. It's found in writings of um, Egyptian medicine, uh, Greek, Roman, and Chinese medicine as well. As far as the benefits of garlic, uh, they are rather broad, and we could do an entire class probably just on the health benefits of garlic, but I'll give you kind of a, an overview of, of some of those. Uh, the, the, the place where garlic is most well known for, or where it's been gotten the most um, studies done on it and, and um, publicity has been around its effects on our cardiovascular health. Uh, uh, cardiovascular disease is one of the, the number one uh, causes of death in this country. So we're always looking for things that can try to improve our, the health of our cardiovascular system. And, um, and garlic has a number of positive effects for doing that. There's been studies showing that garlic consumption will help to lower uh, blood pressure. Uh, it will also help in lowering um, the, uh, the what's known as LDL cholesterol, or what's sometimes labeled as the, the bad cholesterol, while raising up the levels of the HDL, or the, the good cholesterol. Um, it also has an effect of decreasing the kind of the stickiness in the, in the blood, and so you don't get clot formation quite as readily, and so it can help in preventing against the formation of uh, blood clots in preventing against um, the occurrence of heart attacks and strokes as well. Garlic also has an effect on decreasing uh, something called inflammation. And, and inflammation has been associated with an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. And we think of inflammation typically as, a, you know, in an acute sense, as, as an injury. You know, you, you sprain your ankle and it turns red and it swells. That's, a, that's kind of an acute inflammation. But what ends up happening is that Many different things can cause kind of chronic inflammation to be occurring in the body where you're not necessarily having a swollen ankle, um, but you're having um, damage and uh, uh, swelling internally that, that we can't really see. It can be on a, in a very microscopic level. And that inflammation, whether it's in the blood vessels or in the gastrointestinal tract, can increase the, the uh, risk of cardiovascular disease as well. So, one of the things that garlic does is helps in lowering the production of, of some of the inflammatory compounds, similar to you know, taking an, an aspirin or taking uh, a Tylenol, having a similar type of effect of decreasing the production of some inflammatory <coughs> compounds. And a number of things that I'm going to talk about today have that anti-inflammatory um, um, property to them. 
beyond being anti, oh, and, and so with that anti-inflammatory property, beyond does it help for uh, cardiovascular disease, is that it also can be helpful for people who suffer from arthritis, whether that's uh, what we call osteoarthritis, or kind of, which is the, or the wear and tear arthritis um, that we get as we get older, or uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which is more of an autoimmune condition. Uh, in both cases, it's been found to uh, decrease the, the pain um, associated with them and, and, and help uh, with uh, decreased stiffness as well. Uh, it's also been helpful from that anti-inflammatory standpoint, also helpful for people with asthma because there's an inflammatory component that takes place there. So another big uh, property of garlic is the fact that it is antibacterial. Again, as I was talking about before, many of these things were used because they help preserve food, and, and garlic is one of those that actually will kill microbes on, in, in, on the food when it's, when it's placed there, so it does act as a preservative that way. Um, but this can also be helpful for uh, bacteria and viruses that we are exposed to. Uh, garlic and a compound from garlic called allicin um, has been found to be effective against many viruses, including the cold virus and the flu virus, and some of the uh, some gastrointestinal viruses as well. It's also been found to be protective or effective against. Uh, the virus that causes warts. Uh, you can actually take a slice of garlic and stick it on a wart, um, and you will actually see some decrease and, and eventually eradication of the wart. Uh, one thing that I do recommend with that uh, is that it does, well, it, it smells like garlic, so if you don't want everyone uh, wondering when you're shaking their hand why, uh, why you eat the garlic, um, you, you can do this at night uh, and put it on and have it then, you know, then you just have to deal with it if you you have a spouse, or <laughs> they um, their concerns, but <coughs> make it so that you know, just wearing it at night can be effective uh, over time for that as, as well. And I have had, for myself, and I've had patients do this for, for work, and it, it does seem to be quite effective. It can be a little irritating uh, to the skin, and so I'll find a lot of people put a little Vaseline around where the, the work is, and then put the, the garlic on top, and then just put a band-aid to hold it in place. Uh, and then the last, the last kind of thing around, or the last two things around garlic are uh, it's been shown to have beneficial um, uh, preventative properties against certain types of cancer, um, particularly cancers that have, are, take place in the gastrointestinal tract, so those are the esophagus um, and the stomach and the, uh, the large intestine, but also cancers of the, of the kidney, prostate, and, uh, and breast as well. So again, it's, it's, if you have cancer, Taking garlic isn't necessarily going to get rid of it, but there has been association with being able to decrease the occurrence of some of these cancers with high consumption of garlic in the diet. Um, and garlic, lastly, has an effect on blood sugar. Uh, blood sugar dysregulation is becoming a more and more common issue in this country, and uh, something called metabolic syndrome is greatly increasing in its, its occurrence. Um, garlic has an effect of, of um, potentiating the effect of insulin, and so in doing so, it helps to bring down the, 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 the levels of, of, of the sugar levels in, in the blood. Um, and so, doing that has been helpful to kind of modulate uh, the, the um, uh, slightly elevated uh, blood sugar levels and helping to prevent against the, uh, the occurrence of diabetes. Um, and there's actually been some new research, with, and it's still just in rat studies, but actually showing that partly because of that effect. Uh, garlic having some effect on, on uh, inhibiting weight gain as well. So, a robust uh, pharmacy all in one on one plant, um, you know, with many different different actions. Then you know, a, a bowl of garlic uh, costs you know maybe thirty or forty cents. It's not a very expensive uh, treatment as well, uh, and it can be you know utilized quite uh, broadly in. in the diet. In your handout, I have uh, a listing of some different ways and ideas that you could use garlic in. Um, but I always like when I do this talk to, to hear if anybody has any any specific ways in which they like incorporating garlic into their diet. Any always looking for new ideas. And again, um, any, there was a number of people who said that they like cooking with garlic. Any any ways that you would like to have garlic in your in your diet? Minced. Minced. And just in sauces, like sauce. spaghetti sauce or alfredo sauce. Any other garlic 
uses? Stir fry. In a stir fry. And so you have the great just throwing it in the stir fry. Crushed and um, ground and then tossed with green peas. Mm -hmm. In all the There's many, many different vegetables that go well with garlic. Uh, on the, the back of your handout, in addition to the um, serving suggestion, I there's actually a chart that goes along uh, with various vegetables and uh, some grains as well, as far as um, some of the spices we're going to talk about today and ones that match up well with that. So if you, you, know, if you have um, one of those vegetables, you can kind of look and see, oh, which one of these herbs might I want to try pairing it with as well. So does cooking change the cooking, uh, beneficial properties of it? Or? Cooking does decrease the beneficial properties. There's, there's a couple of things with garlic. One is that if you were just to swallow the whole clove of garlic without chewing it, it's actually not going to be that effective because you actually need to break up the cells of the garlic a little bit to release the, and to activate the, um, the, the active constituents. Um, and then cooking it begins to start to decrease the levels of some of those as well. Now you're not going to completely eliminate it. And so if you're having some garlic cooked in your diet every day, it's not like it's going to have no benefit. You don't have to just be eating raw garlic to get the, get the benefit. Um, the more you cook it, the less beneficial effect it's going to have. So if you're uh, sauteing it in oil and it starts to get really, really crisp and brown, that's going to be less beneficial than if you kind of lightly saute it. Um, um, garlic on the bottom of the picture, right? Kind of garlic powder and garlic granules. And again, they also um, do have uh, the you know, less of the beneficial properties of the fresh garlic, but still quite um, quite strong in those. As far as the amounts um, necessary for for some of these properties, um, uh, an eighth to a quarter teaspoon of the uh, the dried. Um, powder is enough, um, one fresh whole clove um, can be enough for, for many of the, the pieces of the day. If it's cooked, it, it goes up to you know, about double that on the, um, with the fresh, there'll be a couple of cloves of the fresh garlic. And the garlic cloves greatly vary in size. Um, uh, the, the amount is two and a half grams, so if you're going to weigh your individual garlic cloves, you want one that's about two and a half grams um, to get the, the beneficial effect. So. And again, there's a, a number of other different ways to use garlic in in the, uh, the handout as well. So Excuse me, you. you said that you could break up fibers if eating it raw is better. Do so you what mean just slicing it? So slicing it, yeah. It's just if you, if you were to take the whole clove and just swallow it down, you're not going to be breaking those cell walls. My mother-in-law will slice it thin and put it in water, and the water just helps get it down. She's mm -hmm. not chewing it, she just swallows it. She slices it, but swallows it. So as soon as you slice it, you yeah. damage those cell walls and you're going to start to, for, to increase the production of the allicin. Um, so, so yes, that is one way of doing it. You can yeah. just slice it and, 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 down, and, it. and, and down it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Sir. So any other questions, comments about garlic? Can you overdo it other than the ones that would stand next to you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> is there too much garlic that can damage the system or something. Some people do have to be more careful with garlic um, because of if the effect I talked about it on, on its effects on blood clotting. Some people who are more prone to to their blood being too thin can have an effect from eating too much garlic. People who are taking medications that thin their blood can also have a negative impact from the garlic. Uh, but just in eating it, that's it's, it's if you don't have those issues, it's hard to get to that place. Um, some people also have a hard time digesting some of the um, carbohydrates that are in garlic and can cause some gastrointestinal uh, issues there too, and that's not an uncommon uh, piece. One thing with that, if, if, if you have that where you, know, where you eat garlic and you find that it causes you to get either gas or bloating or, or other discomfort, uh, if you saute the garlic in oil and then you remove the garlic, so you remove all of the, the um, the, the chunks of it, and it's just leaving the oils that have gone into the, uh, that typically does not cause the gastrointestinal issues. The carbohydrates that are in the, the actual garlic seem to be what causes that. So if anybody has that, it's a way to be able to get the enjoyment of garlic without the, um, the upset. So. Did, did you say um, that, that for the beneficial effects, 
Two cooked cloves equals one raw. It, it's not, yeah, that's kind of, and again, it, and again it's, if you're going to measure it, the clove should be about two and a half grams um, in weight. Um, so again, there's a lot of variations. Sometimes you can get a head of garlic where the cloves are this big, and sometimes they're that big. Um, elephant garlic, uh, which you'll sometimes see at the grocery store, which looks like a really large head of garlic, is actually not garlic, it's actually more closely related to leeks than garlic, and so uh, it is not going to quite have this, this, these properties. Um, there are some things that are um, inherent to garlic, onion, mean, leeks, all of the, of the, but it, you can't, it's not, elephant garlic is not jumbo garlic. It's, it's, um, so as I said, we could do an entire class just on, on garlic. It's got quite a powerhouse of different things that mention that beneficial effect. Um, the next one is uh, cinnamon, uh, and cinnamon is actually the bark of a tree. Um, and you can see the, the, the cinnamon tree up here. It's uh, native to Sri Lanka, uh, and it's been used in uh, both medicinal and cooking uh, since at least 3000 BC. Uh, what they end up doing is drying the, the, the bark into the quills that become the cinnamon sticks that you may be familiar, familiar with. Um, with cinnamon, it, the big thing that it's gotten a lot of um, uh, studies done on in, in the last decade for are its effects on, on blood sugar and on cholesterol as well, and finding that uh, cinnamon consumption does help to uh, lower blood sugar levels and also seems to help to lower um, the uh, total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol as well. Interestingly, the way that this was originally discovered was in looking at the effects of, of apple pie increasing blood sugar levels and looking at an apple pie that had cinnamon in it and one that did not have cinnamon in it and the one with cinnamon had less of an effect of raising blood sugar than the one uh, without cinnamon. Um, but so then because of that, numerous studies have been done on this uh, both in people with diabetes and people without diabetes and finding that it does seem to have a nice effect on modulating blood sugar. Uh, the nice thing with it is that this tastes good as well. Um, and you don't need a tremendous amount. Uh, there was a, a beneficial effect seen at amounts um, as small as a quarter of a teaspoon. And so mixing a quarter of a teaspoon of cinnamon into your oatmeal um, or sprinkling it on, on, on applesauce or on fruit or just using that cinnamon you know, in that small amount will have a positive effect. Uh, there was greater benefit seen up to amounts of a, a full teaspoon, uh, but again, some benefit seen just in, in a quarter teaspoon. Uh, in addition to its benefits on blood pressure or on blood sugar, um, it also has some cardiovascular other cardiovascular benefits in the fact that it also will reduce um, blood clotting um, and also has a, an anti-inflammatory effect similar to, to garlic as well. But an interesting other benefit of, of cinnamon is its effects on um, enhancing brain function and cognitive enhancements. Um, and so um, there was improvement in recall and memory just with the either smelling cinnamon <coughs> or chewing cinnamon gum. So you don't even actually have to eat it uh, completely, but it, just the smell of cinnamon will help to improve uh, blood, flow, blood flow to the brain and, and enhance cognitive function. So, if you're at your desk and you're feeling like you're not quite as sharp as you would like to be, uh, taking out a cinnamon stick and smelling it, or, you know, I'm not necessarily a big fan of, of, of gum, but, you know, chewing on some cinnamon gum will actually, uh, if it actually has cinnamon oil in it, um, will help to improve uh, brain function as well. That's something that was interesting that you mentioned in the last presentation in Portland was that cinnamon is really not the cinnamon that we think it is. Yeah, so cinnamon, um, the cinnamon that you buy in the grocery store is actually not true cinnamon. It's actually another similar uh, plant called kasha. Um, and part of the reason for that is that kasha is a lot cheaper than cinnamon. Uh, it has a similar um, beneficial profile. So anything that I've said about cinnamon, what you buy in the store will actually have that effect. But if you actually uh, buy true cinnamon, which you can find uh, true cinnamon, it's a little bit, um, the, the flavor of it is actually more like the flavor of like big red um, 
chewing gum as opposed to the, the, the flavor of the, the powdered cinnamon that we think about um, in this country has more of that, uh, that a little bit sharper of, of flavor to it. Um, so uh, again, most people associate with the, the cinnamon flavor that we think of today with the, uh, with the, the kach, what is actually the, the kacha. Kacha with a C A S S I A, not Kacha K A S A J, which is buckwheat. It's not really into buckwheat. Uh, that's so, not well, that, that's not true. What you typically buy in the store is not true cinnamon. Uh, but again, the health benefits are the same, so you don't have to worry about the going and finding. Uh, you know, at specialty food markets, you can oftentimes find true cinnamon, uh, and it's a lot more expensive than than just the. Uh, you the eat the sticks. I mean, the sticks are true cinnamon. So even yeah, even the sticks that you see, you know, the, the, the cinnamon sticks are not true cinnamon. They're, the, they're sticks of kasha. Um, you can get true cinnamon sticks, and they're actually quite a bit larger and a little bit lighter in color um, than that. Um, they, they're a little bit more brittle as well. We've been duped as a country. Oh no, I'm disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but again, you can't get it. Uh, there's a number. There's a spice market called the uh, uh, World World Market Spice out of Seattle that that is one of the better spice uh, companies that I've done, and, and I, you will get uh, true cinnamon sticks from them. Um, and again, and I have seen it at like, uh, LaRue in, um, in Portland, and they, they have the, the true cinnamon. Again, you're going to pay more for it. Um, so that is cinnamon. Uh, as far as uses for cinnamon, again, I mentioned a couple of things, you know, putting it on um, oatmeal or, or putting it on, on applesauce. Uh, there's some other thoughts here in the handout as well. Um, anybody have any application to use of the cinnamon that they enjoy? I put it in pancakes. Pancakes? And uh, banana bread. Um, one thing and is that cinnamon, we typically think about using it in sweet dishes, but it can also go nicely in, in savory things as well. It, it mixes in with Middle Eastern cooking, mixing it in tomato sauces, and, and actually uh, it pairs well with chickpeas as well. And so thinking about it beyond just um, in desserts <coughs> and pies and sweet things, um, it will add kind of an interesting flavor to, to bean dishes as well. And uh, goes well with lamb as well. So next, um, and Turmeric was, was mentioned was, was mentioned before as well. So this is turmeric. Um, this is the, uh, the the flour that actually produces, which is quite beautiful. It's um, very similar to uh, what we'll see shortly. Ginger has a very similar plant and, and flour as well, and they are related. Um, turmeric is actually the, the rhizome of, of the plants, um, and it is native to uh, Southeast uh, India and Indonesia. And it's been harvested there for over 5,000 years and used in cooking, but also used as a, um, as a pigment, as a dye, because it's a very uh, strong yellow color. And so it's used for uh, fabric uh, dyeing as well. Um, it's also sometimes used uh, in place of saffron because it's a lot cheaper than saffron um, as well, but will give that, that yellow color to foods that saffron does too. Uh, it's, the major, it's one of the major ingredients in curries and or curry powder. Well, that's probably one of the places where most people have experienced customer. Uh, the primary or the, the kind of the, the, the strongest benefit of turmeric that's been found is as its uh, anti-inflammatory effect. Um, and it's actually been found to be comparable um, to um, hydrocortisone and also to Motrin in head-to-head -head studies that we've done with that. So that would be for um, Kind of helping with musculoskeletal aches and pains in particular, um, but also having some beneficial effects for headaches too. <coughs> it's also quite helpful for gastrointestinal complaints, uh, particularly if there's inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract. So if someone has inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease or uh, ulcerative colitis, it can be helpful for that. Uh, but it also has been helpful for uh, irritable bowel syndrome and helping to decrease uh, gas and bloating and, and improving. Uh, regularity of, of bowel function too. Uh, with its anti-inflammatory effect, it's also quite helpful for um, people with arthritis um, in helping to increase mobility and decreasing pain uh, and uh, decreasing uh, one of the things with uh, arthritis oftentimes will have morning stiffness, you know, where it takes a little while to get going, and uh, tumor has been found to 
decrease uh, the length of time that it takes for that morning stiffness to go away. There's also beneficial effects uh, for preventing certain cancers. Um, again, uh, cancers of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, most notably, uh, but also some effect on uh, lung cancer as well. Uh, and it also seems to help to inhibit the carcinogenic effect of, of uh, cigarette smoke as well. So if someone who is smoking and, again, I don't want to encourage people to smoke, but if someone who is a smoker, consuming turmeric will actually help to decrease some of the, um, the, the cancer-causing effect of smoking. Or if you're, if you're exposed to a lot of secondhand smoke, turmeric would be a good spice for you to be consuming in your diet. Daily? Daily would be an ideal situation. Particularly, this is one that, you know, for if you're having the pain, if you're having, if you suffer with arthritis, you know, having it in your diet on a daily basis is going to be the, best, the optimal way for trying to decrease the pain. Um, and then a similar thing if you're exposed to cigarette smoke on a daily basis, having the turmeric in your diet on a daily basis is good. Um, as far as the amounts, this is one that for people with severe inflammation and pain, I often I will use it in a concentrated capsule form because of the amount. Um, the amount of trend would be one to four teaspoons of the powder is, is kind of the dose. It's a, a little bit larger of an amount, um, and uh, you know depending on the severity of the of the, the pain, um, often I need to go up in higher amounts. I mean certainly that can be consumed in those amounts, but sometimes people when I get up to that type of dosing prefer just to be able to take a capsule of it. Um, if you get the fresh turmeric, uh, which you can oftentimes get uh, in um, Asian markets and they even have it at Whole Foods from time to time, uh, the equivalent would be consuming about um, a half to an inch of the, the uh, fresh turmeric. Uh, as far as ways to enjoy the turmeric, um, there's a few different things listed down here in the handout. I use it a lot um, in, um, in doing more curry and sort of dishes. Um, and so there's a, a recipe here for an Indian style of rice dish that uses uh, turmeric in it. Um, but it also goes very well with, with legumes. It also, as I was saying before, it gives a that yellow pigment without having a really strong flavor. And so uh, sometimes people will put it in egg salad to make it even brighter as well. Uh, and so, uh, those are, again, just a few of the places where it can come in. Uh, but again, more, more prominent in uh, cooking from, uh, from, from India. Anybody have any uses of, of turmeric that they their Mostly eggs. I just put it in my scrambled eggs. Scramb yeah, again, yeah. it's going to brighten it up. And that's a good way if you're trying to get it on a daily basis, putting it in something like eggs, it's not going to make the food look it's going to make it more yellow, and it doesn't have a strong flavor to it. It also goes well if you, if you don't eat eggs and you, uh, scrambled tofu. Oftentimes, people will throw turmeric in it to kind of make it look like egg. Um, so that is turmeric. I have um, a question. I don't know if it's turmeric or lavash, but I've heard of it being used in like Yeah, so a small amount of turmeric is sometimes added to mustard to give it that yellow color. It's not a large amount, but it's a natural coloring. It's oftentimes put in things as a natural yellow color. <coughs> that's where it'll be added. It's oftentimes put in um, pickles as well, because it gives that yellow color to the to the pickle liquid without using um, FPNC yellow number five. So it's a, a, a better way, but you're not really getting a lot of it. Yeah. Of that. So I would say adding more you know, turmeric with mustard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be too, but you're going to need to, to get it in greater quantities than that to have a beneficial effect. Um, so a cousin of turmeric is ginger, which uh, ginger is probably more commonly consumed in this country than, than, than turmeric. Um, ginger, like turmeric, is also a rhizome, and again, here you can see the, the, the pretty flower that, that, that comes from it. Um, it's also uh, native to uh, Southeastern Asia um, and has been uh, used in Chinese, Indian, and Middle Eastern uh, cooking and medicine for, for thousands of years. Um, interestingly, ginger now, and there is a, there's a, a couple of farmers in Maine who are actually growing ginger um, in Maine. Um, at the Portland Farmers Market, the end of the, the summer, you're able to buy fresh Maine-grown ginger. It uh, doesn't store really well. 
uh, but it, it has a great flavor for fresh. So if you're looking to, I freeze it. Is that a bad thing? No, freezing ginger is actually fine. Like if you get a big, a lot of ginger, and you're not going to use it. Mm -hmm. and, it and if you've peeled it, particularly freezing mm -hmm. it is going to keep it uh, pretty well uh, and without it losing much of its uh, beneficial effects. Um, if you don't peel it, and it will last for for um, for keeping it out of the refrigerator. You know, it'll last for. Um, several weeks uh, without going bad. If you haven't taken the skin off the bone, you take the skin off of it, it's going to start drying up pretty quickly. Um, as far as... It shouldn't be stored in the refrigerator? If you, once you've cut it, you, you can put it in the refrigerator. What's going to end up happening um, is that um, it will uh, tend to dry out in the refrigerator, um, which isn't necessarily mean that it's gone bad. You can still use it, it's just the liquid is gone. Um, and dry ginger, you know, is often but if you're trying to use, you know, have chopped up fresh ginger, it's often it's hard to do that once they, it, it's dried out. Um, so freezing it is one way to keep it to last longer. If you buy, you know, a lot of it, or if you minced up a bunch and you're not going to use it that day, you know, freezing the minced ginger um, is fine. And people go well, mince up quite a bit of it and, and freeze it in ice cube trays, and then you just pull out an ice cube, you know, a ginger cube, and put it in um, what you're wanting to get the ginger flavor. Um, with its beneficial properties, it, it has quite a few, but one area that it's uh, had uh, some interesting effect on is on the gastrointestinal tract and actually being quite effective uh, for decreasing nausea. Um, and uh, it's in fact actually being comparable and, and even in some studies actually superior to Dramamine um, uh, for use with seasickness. Uh, so if you are prone to seasickness, um, having some ginger tea or, or chewing some ginger wire on the boat can help to decrease that, that seasickness. Uh, but another area of nausea that it has been helpful with um, and that it's safe for using with is actually nausea in pregnancy as well. Uh, it does not have negative impacts on the uh, growing fetus, but it also does work as well for decreasing the, uh, the, the occurrence of the nausea too. Uh, it also works for run-of-the-mill nausea. I mean, if you have a <laughs> stomach uh, uh, virus and you're, you're nauseous, Ginger will help to, to quell that, or if you just have nausea because you're um, you know, nervous about something, that will also, um, the ginger does help to, to decrease the nausea there. So, um, it's good, a good thing to think about to have on hand, you know, because you never know what you're going to feel on. Um, it also has the, uh, some of the anti inflammatory effects that I talked about before. Um, combining ginger and turmeric together is oftentimes used for people who have arthritis. Uh, to kind of even a greater uh, anti-inflammatory effect and decreasing pain. Uh, ginger also can be helpful against uh, certain headaches as well, particularly more uh, tension and cluster headaches, um, but in some cases migraines as well. Uh, and so uh, another good application for a reason to have it on. And it seems to, in migraines, there's, it, does, it will help prevent migraines from occurring. With the other headaches, they it can be helpful once you actually have the headache to, um, to, to decrease the severity of it. Ginger, and then we're getting into cold and flu season, uh, ginger does have some immune boosting properties um, and helping to uh, antiviral properties against um, some of the viruses that are responsible for the, the common cold. It also seems to decrease uh, nasal congestion and is <coughs> nice for uh, decreasing uh, soreness in the throat as well. So drinking a, if you have a sore throat and your nose is all stepped up, drinking a cup of the ginger tea can be helpful both to soothe the sore throat but then also to, um, helping against the virus that may be causing it as well. So, um, and again, this one tastes, uh, tastes really good, so it's actually not too hard to incorporate um, into food. Um, and for things, applications like the, uh, the sea sickness, you know, even like the candy ginger that you can get will work for, for the anti-nausea effect. And oftentimes, uh, uh, pregnant women that I work with who are having nausea uh, pregnancy, I'll have them you know, carry around a bag of of candy ginger with them and, and it does seem to work for, for, for getting rid of the, the, the nausea. Um, so there's a recipe in here for, for ginger tea um, and for adding it to lemonade, um, adding it to rice, putting it in stir fries, making a salad dressing. Um, but any other ways that people like to, to have ginger? Or uh, Some ginger ales actually do have ginger in them, but you can go look at the label and actually see more of the ginger beers are going to actually have ginger. 
your abstract, and again, that will help with the particular with the knowledge of um, the, if it does have actual ginger in it. I've seen people use it in their coffee. Putting it in their coffee. Yeah, yeah you can definitely get a number of the, the, the spices. You can get a nice thing coffee with cinnamon and, and cloves that we'll talk about as well. Yeah, uh, it makes it like, that, like a chai. Yeah, it yeah. kind of gives that, yeah. that nice flavor. So combining you know, ginger and cinnamon and cloves and, and a little nutmeg would, would actually taste quite nice, especially this time of year for a, a nice spice coffee. Uh, as far as the amounts, uh, the you know a, a quarter to a half teaspoon of the dried or a quarter inch to a half inch of the fresh is typically the, the, the dose that's used uh, with objects. One of the things was kind of uh, you know sipping on the tea until it, it goes away. Uh, Does it lose the properties if you're cooking it with it? It not as well, no it, it's not this one is not as affected uh, like this by the, the cooking like garlic. Um, it, it does not. Either way, uh, and you have to skin it first. You don't have to. The skin has to be a little bitter, um, so there's nothing harmful to the skin. Uh, but most people will skin it just because the skin does have a little bit of a bitter flavor. Um, so it depends a little bit what you're doing. If you're making a tea and you're just want to cut it up and throw it in, the skin doesn't really negatively affect that. But if you're putting it in like a stir fry or something like that, taking the skin off is going to taste a little bit better. Oh, sure. You can also store ginger by cutting it up in thin slices, put it in vinegar in a jar of vinegar, and then you just stick it out. And you don't need to even peel it. And you can also store it either in rum or just clear alcohol. Mm -hmm. And it will, then if you take it out and when you cook with it, if you are averse to alcohol, that alcohol evaporates. Yeah, those are both. Um, and if you're not averse to alcohol, it actually flavors the, the alcohol quite nicely um, as well on the other side. It um, can also be stored in honey as well as another place that, that, that you can store ginger as well. And then actually the, the, the ginger and honey can be actually quite nice and soothing if you have a sore throat. So celery is next, and again, we typically think about celery as a plant um, and the stalk, but the, the seed uh, does have some medicinal properties to it that I just wanted to mention briefly. Um, the, the big one with uh, celery is actually its effect on blood pressure, uh, and then the celery seed um, is high in a compound that will actually lower uh, blood pressure. It actually uh, consuming a, a teaspoon of Celery seed was found to lower blood pressure by about 14 percent. So, effective, relatively effective uh, method of, of trying to drop blood pressure a little bit. You can get the effect from eating uh, the stalks of celery, but you have to eat four stalks of, of celery um, to get the, the equivalent to a teaspoon of the, the seed. Um, in addition to the effect on, on blood pressure, it also has <coughs> effect on cholesterol. So, I will oftentimes recommend uh, people who are working with cardiovascular issues to uh, consume celery seed and celery uh, frequently in their diet. Uh, it also has a little bit of a diuretic effect, and so with that it does seem to help to uh, decrease the formation of kidney stones. So if you're someone who's prone to kidney stones, um, having some celery seed um, and celery um, daily can be helpful in prevention of that. Also uh, helps in preventing um, uh, gout um, as well. And so if you are a person who's prone to gout, gout is a extremely painful condition, and people like to try to do anything they can to prevent it if they do have it. Um, and regular consumption of celery seed will help to prevent um, a gout attack from occurring um, in, in many cases. Um, as far as the flavor of celery seed, it basically tastes like celery, so it will impart a celery flavor to whatever you put it in. So it's very good in soups and stews. Um, and sauces for that effect, oftentimes used on salads, um, things such as uh, coleslaw or potato salad as well to give that celery flavor or put into salad dressing as well. Um, you can just get you know, one patient who just likes to chew the, the teaspoon of celery seed. It, it uh, does get stuck in the teeth, but it, it doesn't have a, an off, a, a, you know, it's going to just be a strong, intense celery flavor. Um, anyone else use celery seeds anywhere or in any other kind of application? So, um, I use it when I'm making tuna salad. Oh yeah, again, it gives up celery. Yeah, anything where you're wanting 
to get that celery flavor, but not, um, not actually use, you know, you don't have a thing that celery sitting around that's good for adding. Any benefits to celery salt? Or? Um, well, with celery salt, if, if you are, if it's a person who's sodium sensitive and the, the salt is going to raise the blood pressure, okay. you're really going to be negating the effect. The uh, oftentimes celery seed is used in salt substitutes because it actually has a little bit of a saltiness to it, um, and so it can sometimes putting just pure celery seed on things can oftentimes take the place of, of salt or heat. It, it's again an ingredient oftentimes in uh, your salt uh, preparations. But if you the, by having it in the celery salt, it's really going to negate the, the, the beneficial uh, properties of it. Um, just quick on rosemary. Uh, it's another um, common herb um, that um, is native to the Mediterranean as well. Um, it has some beneficial properties for uh, the immune system as well um, and helps increase the circulation. Um, and with that circulatory enhancement, uh, one of the studies that's been looked at with rosemary is on increasing uh, blood flow to the brain and in doing so enhancing uh, memory um, and improving concentration as well. So if you don't have your cinnamon stick at your desk, having a little spray of rosemary at your desk um, to help to improve brain function can be helpful. We actually, uh, when I was back in school, during exams, uh, periods, uh, people would oftentimes have sprigs of, of rosemary on their desk and be sniffing it during the exam. Uh, whether it worked or not, I'm not sure, but it always smelled really nice in the, in the exam uh, with that. Um, there are some topical uh, preparations that are used uh, rosemary oil for actually rubbing into muscle paint because it has some anti-inflammatory properties. And then there's one interesting study on uh, uh, rosemary being used to uh, stimulate hair growth. Um, there was a study looking at 84 people um, with a, a, a disease called uh, alopecia areata where the, um, the hair uh, falls out in patches and they massage their scalps with uh, rosemary, um, a rosemary oil uh, for seven months and those who rubbed their head with the rosemary oil actually did have um, significant hair growth compared to those who did not. So, the only study I've been able to find on that, so I haven't seen it being reproduced, but if you are looking to regrow your hair and you like the smell of rosemary, it's not going to hurt in any way. And it may also, because you're smelling that rosemary on a regular basis, improve your, your concentration and brain function while you're at it. So not a bad side effect um, compared to some of the side effects of, of meditation. Let's see. For the time, I'm going to skip over sage because there's not a lot. There just, it's in your handout with kind of a, just a little bit of a, a thing about that. It also has some, like, some brain enhancing uh, properties. Cloves, uh, this time of year, kind of as we go into uh, you know, thinking about apple pie and, and pumpkin pie, which are holidays, cloves uh, oftentimes gets taken out of the, um, the spice cabinet, um, used a couple of times. Uh, it also has anti-inflammatory effects. And it can be quite good for uh, sore throats and also for uh, toothaches, and, and especially if there's gum uh, soreness or pain occurring. Uh, you can get uh, actually uh, clove oil at the, at the pharmacy where you can uh, put a couple of drops on that and gargle with it or put it onto the, the gum or tooth. But you can also just use the uh, whole cloves and either dry them up and rub the powder on or maybe tea. Um, to sip to, to actually have that anti-inflammatory effect and soothe the, the sore throat. Um, cloves do have some effect on stimulating uh, gastrointestinal function, and so if your stomach has kind of a sluggish gastrointestinal tract, um, cloves will actually help to stimulate um, the motion of the intestines, and so things will move through a little bit faster. And cloves also have a, a, a mild sedative effect. So if you are drinking clove tea to help with your sore throat, it may, you may notice that you uh, feel a little bit drowsy with that as well. Um, but it, on a positive effect of that, if you have a sore throat and it's decreasing your ability to, uh, to sleep, drinking a cup of clove tea before going to bed can be a great way to kind of both get rid of the, the pain of the sore throat and, um, and help you to sleep as well. Um, Clothes are, there's actually a flower bud that's been dried. Um, 
young, the, uh, the, the flow of trees are uh, native to, um, the, to Indonesia as well. Uh, cloves are one that, you know, that, again, with some of these spices, when they, you, know, you get a, a container of it and you use only a tiny bit each year, one of the things I have to point out is that, uh, especially once they've been ground, spices do lose both their flavor and their benefits um, over a relatively quick amount of time. Uh, one way to know whether or not something is still potent is to actually to take it out and smell it and taste it. If it really doesn't have a strong, robust flavor to it, it's probably not good. Um, you know, if you have that jar of McCormick, McCormick's uh, clothes that have been in your spice cabinet since 1972, time to throw it out and, and, and get some fresh. Um, buying whole spices will last quite a bit longer until they're ground. They actually retain their freshness um, for quite some time. So getting a little spice grinder or an extra coffee grinder and getting the whole spices will oftentimes make it so that things don't go bad. They, you know, the whole spices will last for years um, without decreasing their, uh, both their potency for flavor, but also the medicinal properties as well. Uh, this is oregano, which is native to uh, the Mediterranean as well. Um, I want to point it in out because it has some fairly uh, potent antibacterial properties um, and uh, there's been studies showing it to be effective against the growth of, of um, the uh, staph strain uh, that's referred to as MRSA, which um, uh, there's been you know, concern about uh, decreased ability for antibiotics to, um, to, to help with some of these bacteria, finding that some of the compounds from oregano and other herbs in the family of oregano, such as thyme, having compounds in them that, uh, that are quite effective against some of these bacteria. So uh, pharmaceutical companies are actually looking at insulating compounds from some of these plants for prescriptive medications. But in the meantime, consuming uh, oregano and, um, does have some nice properties against helping to decrease the uh, likelihood of getting foodborne uh, bacterial illnesses. Um, and so you know, if you're using oregano in your cooking on a regular basis, you're probably going to be less likely to catch uh, you know, a foodborne bacterial illness like salmonella. Um, so one thing to think about with that, but wouldn't be surprised to see uh, pharmaceuticals coming out that have been isolated from oregano in the near future. Uh, thyme, as I mentioned, uh, is related to that. It has some similar properties. It has some nice properties for uh, the respiratory tract as well. And actually drinking a thyme tea or breathing in the steam of, of thyme will actually help to loosen up uh, mucus and to, to get some, to move that out, it actually helps, also helps um, if somebody's having a spastic cough, time will help to decrease the spasming of the cough. So that may usually to, actually use it quite a bit um, with children who are having, um, you know, kind of spastic coughs and, and uh, that might be affecting their ability to fall asleep. Uh, drinking a cup of time tea or, or breathing in the steam of, of a strong time tea will actually help to loosen things up. Uh, as well, and kind of move the mucus out. And then it also has antibacterial and antiviral properties, so you're getting uh, some effect against what would be causing the, the cough to begin with as well. Any hey, question? Sure. Uh, you know, when you buy these herbs at a grocery store, the package is more plastic and thin. Do you think that they are really fresh, fresh? Yeah. Not obviously like garden fresh, fresh in your own garden, but do they still have? The essentials, you know, long enough if you keep them in the fridge. Yeah, the two, or? they they do last uh, fair. I mean, as long as the, the leaves are not turning brown and, and mushy, and you know, and, um, uh, they're they're not completely dried out, they're going to be relatively fresh. But the thing with these is that even when they dry, they still retain a lot of the beneficial properties. So the issue is more if it's going, you know, getting more uh, brown and uh, and mushy and, and kind of. Uh, you know, that it's been too much moisture actually will actually be more of an issue than letting them dry out. Um, if you get a, you know, if you get one a packet of thyme or oregano, you're not going to use the entire thing. One thing to do is, you know, what, whatever you don't use, it's just to tie up and let it dry in the kitchen and, and then store it as, as the dryer, and that's actually going to last quite a bit longer. Or you can chop them up, and, as I was talking about before, with the ginger, freezing them in an ice tray um, and then using them frozen as well. So. Yeah, again, it, it's, it's looking at it. If it looks really wilted and brown and slimy, you leave it on the shelf and go for dry. Um, but again, they, they do actually last. Most of these herbs are actually relatively hardy as far as oregano and thyme and, 
uh, more so than basal, which will, you know, it, it ends up wilting relatively quickly. Uh, the uh, regular time will, will last quite a bit longer. Um, black pepper, we oftentimes don't really think a lot about it, other than it's the thing on the, you know, that sits next to the salt on the table. Um, it's a berry uh, from the, the uh, pepper plant. Uh, and it's actually the same berry is used for making black pepper, green pepper, and white pepper. It's just a difference in um, when they are picked and whether or not they are um, fermented or not. Uh, pink pepper is actually not related to pepper. Uh, it's actually a plant that's more closely related to, uh, to ragweed. Um, so if you have a ragweed allergy, avoid pepper corns. Uh, it has a beneficial effect on the gastrointestinal tract, actually, which is good since it tends to be put on food quite frequently, but it actually helps to stimulate the, the taste buds, uh, which then stimulates the secretion of digestive enzymes and, and digestive acid as well. Um, it also has some effect as a carminative, meaning that it helps to expel gas. Uh, so if you're prone to gas and bloating, uh, putting pepper on your food can help to decrease that. Um, it also has some antibacterial uh, properties as well as uses a preservative, preservative agent. And so uh, pepper consumption on food does seem to decrease the, the risk of uh, foodborne illness as well. I'm going through these just because we're near the end of time, so I want to get through the last couple. Um, cayenne is in the uh, pepper, the fruit of the, the cayenne plant. It's the, the first one of the plants we've seen today that's actually native to North America as opposed to the Mediterranean or, um, or Indonesia. Uh, it's been used actually quite a bit uh, as a topic leaf to reduce pain, which seems a little counterintuitive. You think, you know, finding a drug uh, would, would hurt. Uh, but actually what ends up happening is that uh, you almost overstimulate the pain receptors, and so then there's pain relief on the other side. So there's actually, you can go to the drugstore and get um, a topical called capsaicin cream, which is just basically a cayenne cream. Um, and it's used topically uh, for uh, muscle aches and pain, but then also when people have um, shingles, it helps with the, the pain after uh, shingles, and people have neuropathies as well, it can be helpful for those pains too. Um, another counterintuitive thing with cayenne is that it actually helps in uh, preventing and, and healing uh, ulcerations in the stomach. Um, if you would think again, throwing cayenne onto an ulcer would hurt. Uh, but it actually does seem to, to help to prevent against the production of ulcers um, and, uh, and actually helps to soothe and, and heal them as well. And no relation between this pepper and uh, the other pepper that we saw. And the last one on the list is fennel, uh, which fennel we often understand of the plant and using the plant, uh, the, the bulb of the fennel plant, but the, the seed is also um, used in cooking quite a bit. Uh, it's been also native to the Mediterranean and was used quite a bit in Greek and Roman cooking. Um, one of the big uh, benefits of fennel is its effect on the digestive tract as again it would called a carminative, meaning it helps to decrease gas and bloating, and it also helps to stimulate um, digestive function. And so fennel seeds are oftentimes chewed after a meal to kind of help stimulate um, and, uh, digestion and help to relieve any negative discomforts from what you may have eaten. Uh, so it's something to think about having a little dish of fennel seeds that you chew on after a meal or sipping on some fennel tea um, after the meal as well. Um, Fennel tea has been used uh, for helping with colic in babies because of that effect of, of, of having an effect on um, moving gas out of the, the gastrointestinal tract. Um, it's actually been found to help to uh, improve and to decrease the incidences of, of macular degeneration and glaucoma. It's actually quite helpful for eye health as well. So if you're someone who has a, uh, either has macular degeneration or knows that there's a strong family history of it, um, consuming fennel and fennel seeds would be a good way to, uh, to try to prevent that. Uh, one word of caution that I have is that oftentimes there's, um, at um, Middle Eastern and Indian restaurants, there's oftentimes bowls of fennel seeds at the counter, and you can take, and sometimes they have candy on them, and sometimes they're just a seed. Uh, there's now been several studies that have come out showing really high levels of, of uh, somewhat dangerous bacteria on those because of, uh, and so I don't encourage you to, to use those, but if you have your own little supply of fennel seeds, um, chewing those after a meal can be quite helpful to kind of calm the gastrointestinal tract and um, help you to feel you know, 
feel optimal after you eat. That, that also helps with morning sickness too. Morning sickness, yes, yes. Another one that helps with morning sickness on top of that. I guess some of that has to do with that common effect on the gastrointestinal tract. And it's safe to use um, in some of these effects. <coughs> So if you walk with two disease, buy them, don't eat the ones that make a response. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Have your own little couch of, of, uh, of fennel seeds that, that you can uh, avoid. So I know we rushed through the ones at the end, so I didn't talk as much about some of the ways to use them, but those are in your handout there. Um, and I'm happy to answer whatever questions. I don't know that my email is on there, but I actually have my card here that has my email if anybody wants for um, asking questions or anything else about what I've talked about today. Uh, there's also a uh, little card on the back of your handout. Um, I offer a free uh, 30 minutes uh, complimentary um, uh, visit to get to know more about um, my practice and to find out if it's a good fit for you as well. So if anybody has any concerns that they'd like to talk to me about further, I'm happy to, to, to meet with you in that, that way as well. Um, and so, on that note, I hope that I've given you some information that you can perhaps think about as you're cooking, you know, things that you can be adding into your food that may help uh, and have some health that go along with it. And again, think about these things not just as, um, as throw-ins, you know, that, you, that, that, that are of insignificance, but really have both flavor and health benefit to the food as well. So, thank you all for coming today. Thank you.